Well, welcome everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started with our webinar uh, this afternoon. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon from where um, you are located today. I see some of our native Hawaiian relatives um, joining us. So thank you. Uh, this is another webinar brought to you as part of our series with the National Native HIV Network. Um, and we are doing monthly webinars um, this year again. And this is our webinar for this month in April, which is addressing HIV related stigma in native communities. So we want to say welcome to all of you um, in joining us today. And we're going to go ahead and start with a few housekeeping uh, updates and instructions for everyone uh, um, this afternoon and today. And then we'll get started with um, two very great uh, presentation by colleagues of ours uh, with the Urban Indian Health Institute, as well as with the uh, NMAC, the National Minority AIDS Council. Um, so just um, a few things. We have some housekeeping. Um, Savannah, do you want to go ahead and um, do that? Yes. So the session is being recorded today and will be shared on our Facebook page. You can find us at Native HIV on Facebook and also Instagram. Um, we will also post the webinar recording to our YouTube channel. So um, please direct individuals to that. And we will post links to the PDF of the presentation as well. Um, as mentioned in the chat, please introduce yourself with your name, tribal affiliation and your agency. You can use the chat box um, and then post questions throughout the webinar to the Q&A box so that we can keep track of that and they don't get lost in the chat. Um, and then please complete the evaluation at the end of the session, which will actually be emailed out to you in a follow-up email. So thank you, Savannah. Uh, well, I am Elton Moswood. I am Danae Navajo uh, from the Navajo Reservation. I am the coordinator for the National Native HIV Network, uh, which uh, Savannah will explain a little bit more about our network. And I am located in Denver, Colorado. And hello, my name is Savannah Jean, and I am also Danae. I am the Program Director for the Community Health Education and Resiliency Program at the Albuquerque Area Indian Health Board, and also the Administrator of the National Native HIV Network. For any of my Diné relatives, I am Tutsahni, born for Hushkahanzawa. Great, thank you, Savannah. Uh, so we're really excited to have these presenters uh, join us today in talking about HIV stigma, par uh, primarily in our Native community. Um, and so briefly, I'd like to introduce our presenters this afternoon. Uh, we have Leah, Leah Dodge, who is the HIV project lead at the Urban Indian Health Institute in Seattle, Washington. Um, and she will be co-presenting with uh, Bill Hall, who is a member of the Clinkett Nation and is a community advocate. Uh, and then we also have us joining us today is uh, Christopher Paisano, uh, who is um, also Navajo and joining us today. Uh, he is the coordinator for Indian Country uh, for NMAC. And then we also have his colleague, uh, Terrell Parker, who is the associate program manager uh, at NMAC as well. And we'll formally introduce our presenters uh, right before their presentations. Today's webinar is brought to you by the National Native HIV Network, which was established in 2016 as a grassroots effort by several individuals working within the public health and HIV AIDS fields. Um, beginning in 2019, we received funding from the US Department of Health and Human Services Minority HIV AIDS Fund through support from the IHS National HIV AIDS Program. This support allowed us to enhance our membership to 12 regional areas, and each of those areas are represented by regional representatives. Um, each area was able to decide where their representatives came from and also whether or not they represented an urban or rural population. You see our, the, the map here shows each of those regions. And uh, the mission of the National Native HIV Network is an indigenous-led initiative that mobilizes American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian communities affected by HIV through peer-to-peer -peer 
and programmatic support, training, and capacity building assistance. Our comprehensive approach is rooted in our cultural values, teachings, and affection for our communities. It is through this mission that we, we hope to serve and continue to build those relationships with many organizations across the country. All right, thank you, Savannah. And then also just to mention that the National Native HIV Network is funded through the Minority HIV AIDS funding as well. So we're very appreciative uh, to be able to have that support. Um, so now our first presentation, we are very honored to have these um, two distinguished individuals who um, I have met through my work in HIV, but also through the agency, the Urban Indian Health Institute um, in doing this work as well. Um, and so we've done some collaborations in the past and I was really excited to see this presentation at the International AIDS Conference that happened virtually. Um, last summer and was really excited to be able to have um, uh, Leah and Bill join us today to present on their work that they've done to um, destigmatize HIV, but also to be able to use um, some media and the way that um, they've been able to do it. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Leah Dodge, who's a member of the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians. Uh, again, she is the pro HIV pro project lead at the Indian Health Institute. Uh, she has worked with the Institute for over three years um, in that position as the HIV project lead. And in that role, she's responsible for building partnerships with the community and managing the creation of patient and provider education resources. Uh, Leah holds a bachelor's of science degree from Michigan State University and a master's of public health from the University of Washington. And with her, who will be co-presenting is Bill Hall, who is Clinkit and also a, a community advocate. Uh, he is from Southeast Alaska and has been living with HIV for more than three decades in which time has, in which time he has become a courageous advocate sharing his experiences as a native person living with HIV. Bill serves on the Community Advisory Board of Defeat HIV and is a member of the Multicultural HIV and Hepatitis, Hepatitis C Action Network and is a tireless community partner and advisor of the Seattle Indian Health Board and the Urban Indian Health Institute. He is unyielding in his hope for the cure for HIV and resolute in his belief that reducing stigma is fundamental to improving the health outcomes and lives of those living with HIV. He has touched countless lives throughout Indian, Indian country and beyond. And before the COVID-19 pandemic, he hosted and cooked homemade meals for uh, for the Defeat HIV's Community Advisory Board meetings. So um, if you would help me in welcoming Leah and Bill, they may go ahead and do their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Elton. And good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Leah Dodge and I am an enrolled member of the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians. And I am the HIV project lead at the Urban Indian Health Institute, which is located in Seattle, um, but I work remotely in Michigan, um, where I am from. Um, and today, Bill Hall and I are going to be talking about a short film that UIHI produced called Positively Native. Next slide, please. So first, I'm going to give a little background information on the Urban Indian Health Institute and our HIV work. So the Urban Indian Health Institute is a division of the Seattle Indian Health Board, which is a full service primary care clinic and urban Indian health program. Um, we're also one of 12 tribal epidemiology centers. Um, all tribal epidemiology centers partner with local tribes and communities to improve the health and well-being of native people through culturally competent approaches to disease control and prevention. Tribal epidemiology centers often coordinate between tribes, the Indian Health Service, other federal agencies, state governments, and academic institutions. The other 11 tribal epidemiology centers work with tribes regionally, um, while we work with urban Indian organizations across the country, including urban Indian health programs and other um, urban Indian social and health services organizations. 
So UIHI serves to improve the health of American Indians and Alaska Natives by identifying and understanding health disparities and resiliency, strengthening public health capacity, conducting disease surveillance, and developing health promotion and disease prevention materials that are grounded in Indigenous methodologies. Next slide, please. So um, we also received support from the Minority HIV AIDS Fund. Um, and with this, we started a project focused on creating culturally attuned HIV education materials, including print, digital, and video formats for both American Indian and Alaska Native community members and the healthcare providers who serve them. Um, examples of our work include the positively needed video that we'll talk about and watch today. Um, and in addition, we created a facilitation guide and social media toolkit to go along with the, um, the video um, that organizations can use to help bring positively native to their communities. Um, we partnered with Cardia Services to develop online learning modules for healthcare providers on HIV care and sexual health assessment for American Indian and Alaska Native patients. And we're currently developing three additional modules on providing HIV care at the primary care level, harm reduction, and creating adolescent-friendly environments for STD testing and treatment. We also have some fact sheets and posters and an animation about what it's like to talk to a doctor about PrEP. Next slide, please. All right. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the need for Positively Native, which Bill will also um, cover in a few minutes as well. Um, so here you see the HIV care continuum outcomes for American Indians and Alaska Natives compared to whites. So compared to whites, fewer American Indians and Alaska Natives um, know that they have HIV, receive care, are retained in care, and or are vi virally suppressed. Um, well, there are many factors that keep people from receiving the care that they need, like lack of access to care, confidentiality concerns, and a lack of culturally and, and a lack of cultural competency among healthcare providers. Um, we know that stigma plays a significant part. In an analysis of a national surveillance system that collects data about people living with HIV. The CDC found that 78% of American Indians and Alaska Natives um, living with HIV experienced internalized HIV stigma. And I believe that that um, data did not include um, IHS clinics in it. So it, it's very possible that that's even higher. Um, and I wouldn't be from a tribal epidemiology center if I didn't have a caveat about this care continuum data. Um, we don't know how accurate this data is um, because American Indians and Alaska Natives are often classified as white or another race in their health records and in public health reporting systems. Um, one study found that 55% of American Indians and Alaska Natives living with HIV were racially misclassified as a different race in the California HIV AIDS reporting system. And I have read that the disparities between whites and American Indians and Alaska Natives are most likely larger um, than what we're seeing here because of that, those data inaccuracies. Next slide, please. So most HIV education materials are not made by or for Native people. Um, there's a lack of Native data, voices, faces, and imagery in HIV education materials. If you search the CDC and other Department of Health and Human Services websites that both patients and healthcare providers look to for health information, there are very few Native-focused HIV education materials. And when Native um, voices or data are included, deficit-based language is often used, like a focus on alcohol and drugs, poverty, or like a lot of risky behavior. Um, and I've also seen agencies and organizations do things like put a Southwest design on a patient handout and call it culturally competent. And we really need to ensure that the content of materials is also made for American Indians and Alaska Natives. Um, for example, including details about visiting an IHS clinic, a tribal clinic, or an urban Indian health program. And this also goes for materials that are made for both patients and providers. Um, if patients don't see people that look like them in the materials or the materials um, include information that isn't relevant for their care, 
then they aren't going to be interested in looking at the materials. And materials for providers that don't include data about Native people or special considerations for treating Native people leads to culturally incompetent care, um, which can keep people from going to the doctor and getting tested or treated for HIV. So the exclusion of Native people from um, HIV education materials has contributed to a lack of discussion about HIV in Native communities. And this is really further perpetuated stigma and discrimination. Next slide, please. So in making Positively Native, um, UIHI worked with Buffalo Nickel Creative to produce the video, and it was filmed in Seattle. And three long-term survivors, Bill Hall, um, who you just met, uh, Shanna Kozad, and Heyman Itis, were asked to discuss stigma, resilience, and advocacy. And I will add that Bill um, has been a longtime advisor to the HIV project at UIHI and helped come up with the idea um, for this video with his lived experience with stigma. Um, and as I previously mentioned, along with the video, a facilitation guide and social media toolkit were released to help um, lead discussions on HIV and stigma in Native communities. So now Bill is going to talk a little more about uh, why we created the video. Good afternoon and thank you for having me. This video uh, came about uh, when um, a group I was involved with, Defeat HIV, uh, they're a CAB affiliated with the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research on the cure for HIV. And what we did was we went out into communities and we educated the community on where HIV cure was. And one year we were making a list of communities we wanted to focus on for the next year. And Michael, who is our facilitator, suggested Native Americans, which I was excited about. And so I went down to the Seattle Indian Health Board, asked to speak to somebody who could approve events to be presented. And as soon as I mentioned that uh, the subject I wanted to cover was HIV, I could just see that the face go blank. And it, I, got my first taste of what stigma in the Native community was going to be like. So they thought it was a great idea, told me to leave my number and somebody would get back and nobody did. And so for three years, I kept going back and I, whenever I saw them at events, I would approach them and talk to them about presenting. And I saw the executive director at an event one time and I went up to him and I asked him, does the Seattle Indian Health Board provide HIV testing? And he said, no, turned and walked away. So for three years, we battled with them and it took the hiring of a new executive director for us to get our foot in the door. She was very pro-AIDS, Abigail Echohawk, and she was very excited to have us do a presentation. And as we were preparing the presentation, you know, I was talking to her one time and I said, you know, this will all be for naught if we don't battle stigma in the Native community. I had learned through all my involvement with various groups that the biggest reason why Native Americans are among the lowest served communities when it comes to HIV is because nobody was speaking up. And so <clears throat> it was during the planning of this video that uh, I made that 
decision that I wanted to step up and become that advocate. And working with Shanna and, um, oh, I just forgot his name, I'm sorry. Uh, I realized that stigma was the same everywhere. And I think it's important, I think it's the biggest obstacle we deal with stigma and the fact that natives never talk about sex and they still think that HIV is the gay disease. So I hope you enjoy the video. grandmother's bedroom door open and I would hear my uncle come out and he had a distinctive walk because he had uh, one leg that was shorter than the other and he had to wear special shoes. And so I could hear him walking into the living room and I could almost hear him crumpling the newspaper and putting the kindling in and lighting the newspaper and starting the fire. And as soon as the heat started to work its way up into the attic and the wonderful aroma of coffee began to fill the attic, I knew it was just a moment before the women folk would start to get up. I knew it was just a matter of moments before the door to the attic would open and my aunt Rachel would call up and say, it's time to get up. And even before she finished that sentence, I would fly out of bed and I would be dressed and I'd be bounding down the stairs. When I came into the living room, my mom, who had developed severe rheumatoid arthritis and had lost the ability to walk, was in the lounge chair that we had set there for her so she could sit in, sit with the family during the day. Grandma Helen would be seated beside her brushing her hair and I would bound over and I'd jump into her lap and I'd plant bullet kisses all over her face and it would make her laugh and you know that I was just, her laughter just filled my heart. That's how each day began for me, and I really, you know, it's such a comfort to have that. I heard a song one time, it's called, We're Always Looking for What We've Lost. And I remember I would sit for, a, for hours sometimes trying to think about you know, what it is, what is it I've lost? What am I looking for? And, you know, eventually I got to, I'm looking for that closeness. I'm looking for that family that I had as a child because I, you know, it made me feel content and it made me feel safe. And I didn't have that anymore. My name is Bill Hall and I am a Tlingit Indian from Southeast Alaska. I am also a person living with AIDS and have been for well over 33 years now. When I was first diagnosed, I was really angry and really upset. The person who gave it to me knew that they had it, and I thought I was a young woman who knew how to take care of herself. My name is Shanna Kozad. I'm a enrolled member of the Kiowa Tribe of Oklahoma, and I've been living with HIV for 25 years. My name is Heyman Itis. I'm a Lummi Tribal member, and I've been living with AIDS for 24 years. You know, I knew I was gay from the time I was in the sixth grade. It was just who I was, and my 
parents accept me, accepted me for that, and you know there was no shame on, on, on that. So I was able to grow up thinking, well, this is who I am, you know, it's okay. So I was really fortunate to have that in my life. And I've been able to, you know, to carry that throughout my lifetime. People can say whatever they want to say about me. It's like, I know who I am. And Creator knows who I am. Creator knows I'm not an evil person. I tested positive in June of 86. And by then, the disease had already taken hold and it had just been given the name AIDS. Mm -hmm. And the community, you know, you think you can talk to your community about this and other people, but they were so afraid of it that if they even thought you were HIV positive, they moved away from you. Mm -hmm. So it was a very lonely period because I felt so alone. I felt like I had nobody to talk to. First experience I had was learning that in some instances, which is a really hard lesson learned that love was conditional. We love you as long as you don't bring shame on our family. Bring shame on our family and we'll disown you. I think of myself as the reluctant advocate because I'm so not the person to be doing this because I'm so nervous about speaking in front of people. I approach, you know, this by trying to get at that human element by telling them, you know, just what HIV does to you. It impacts your whole life. You know, life as you know it ends when you become HIV positive. And I don't think people think about that when they think about HIV. They don't realize the impact. I know three natives who were so ashamed that they found out they were HIV positive. They lived in constant fear that family and friends would find out and they would be disowned, that they never sought treatment. And because of that, they died. And I think somehow that story needs to be put right out there. I see that our, our communities are, we're really resilient in lots of ways, and then in some ways, we're really fragile. And so when you talk about having HIV in a Native community, it, it gets real tricky. And, it, you know, a lot of people are, are afraid of you. And, um, and I've experienced that. And so it can be really, really hard because we come from proud people with, with strong heritage and strong culture, but you know we want help just as much as, as the next person. And so, but if our own communities don't know how to address that and support it and talk about it, then it makes it hard when you're, you're, you're living with this. As I got married and had uh, two more children through this disease, um, my daughters were, um, we had friends in our neighborhood and uh, friends would come over to our house because we always we had the best trampoline in the neighborhood. And uh, one of the moms saw that I had been interviewed one year for World AIDS Day and the mom recognized me. And she, she told her, her daughters not to come over to our house anymore because she said, well, if that, if that lady has HIV, then I'm sure those kids do, so you don't want to go play over there anymore. And so for a little while there wasn't there weren't any kids coming over. This is your son. This is your daughter. This is the kid you loved as a child. They are no different now because they have HIV. And until we start doing something, our people are gonna die. Having that spiritual strength is so important because you have that, you have that love you have that acceptance. You have that unity. And I think it's so important that we have that in our lives so that we are able to deal with any situation that comes along in our life. 
our spiritual strength is so important. And the work that I do is focused on the Native American medicine wheel, and that's um, learning how to live in balance, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and mentally. We're testimony sitting here of being survivors. We're long-term survivors. And to not let anybody convince you that you're gonna roll over and die tomorrow. We don't have to wait. There's no excuses. It's for all of the health issues that we deal with in Native communities. We have the knowledge to do it now. We don't have to be waiting and wasting time and wasting lives to change this behavior. We don't have to waste all that time. We can do it now. It's important for the new generation of people who are being diagnosed with this to understand that there is 30 plus years of experience and that, that there are elders, there are other native people that are available to talk to about this. And the more talking, the better. The more talking and the more sharing, the better. Mm -hmm. And that we're, we're there to help each other. Now for me, um... I hope that the people that see and watch this video will see the impact that stigma has had on us as people living with HIV and AIDS. And, um, you know, they've heard all the things that we've talked about here. You know, maybe there's somebody out there that has an idea or has, you know, something that they think would help and you know it really is about stepping up there is something that happened in our lives that made us step up and become advocates for this and it really it's going to take so many people and talking about this and there's such i keep saying such a daunting task that it's going to take more than one discussion. Hey folks, my name is Ed Travers, my pronouns are he. Okay, thank you for that wonderful uh, video clip. It was very encouraging to be able to see um, some familiar faces of advocates from the community, um, but I really, I appreciate the video in a sense talking about stigma in our communities because it still exists in our native communities. And so I appreciate the true honest voices that we had from um, Imez, Shauna, as well as Bill um, in letting us know that. And, you know, as a native person, I like to see films that way because it's like storytelling, but it also gives you a sense of a personal connection, um, you know, with our relatives who um, are HIV positive too. So I really enjoyed um, being able to hear their stories, their challenges, and also their uh, advice on helping us um, um, with the HIV stigma that exists in our communities and decreasing that. So are there any final comments from um, Leah and Bill? Well, not final, but any concluding comments from Leah or Bill? I don't have anything right now. Thanks, Elton. Oh, great. Um, if there are any questions uh, for Leo and Bill uh, about the video and about their campaign, feel free to put those in the chat and we have a time
for question and answers um, at the end of the presentations. Uh, we do have one question that I'll um, ask um, our panelists as well uh, that we have here. So thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, our second presentation today is by our friends at, uh, at NMAC. Um, and our first presenter uh, is Terrell Parker, who is a proud black gay professional from Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, who has 10 years of experience in program development, nonprofit management and fundraising. Terrell graduated from Franklin College in 2011 with a BA in English and minor in sociology. He began his career in HIV in 2013 as part of a pilot project of the citywide linkage to care program at Brothers United. Uh, this linkage to care model was recognized by NASTAP, um, his health project as a national best model for engaging black, gay and bisexual men into care. Um, Terrell has served in various leadership roles and is currently the CEO of the Black Dream Company LLC, a business development and talent, talent management company. And our, his co-presenter is Christopher Paisano. Uh, Christopher is a member of the Navajo Nation and is from Wind Rock, Arizona, as well as Oakland, California. Uh, a graduate from the University of California at Berkeley in a BA in linguistics, uh, Christopher began his HIV and AIDS advocacy with the National Native American Age Prevention Center in Oakland, California. Uh, experience on how the federal government and tribal government um, non and nonprofits work are kind of the highlights of that work that he did. Uh, Christopher began studying how <clears throat> for profits operate with the desire to strengthen native economies and those artesian who create livelihood in Indian country. Uh, now Christopher returns to the advocacy uh, work that he has done amongst our Native people, uh, as well as our minority communities. And he is now with NMAC as the American, um, as the Indian country lead uh, to help to defeat HIV stigma and also to end the HIV epidemics for all people. So if you would help me in welcoming our co-presenters for our next presentation uh, from NMAC, Terrell and Christopher. Thank you, everyone. I am going to get us started today. Thank you, Elton and Savannah, for the invitation to present. Um, let's go ahead and get started with today's presentation. We will be discussing some of the work that NMAC is doing around HIV-related stigma, and specifically HIV-related stigma throughout Indian Country and Native Alaska. Next slide, please. So, during today's presentation, we will discuss our Rise Proud 2.0 project and the findings from our focus group in Indian country. We'll also be talking um, about the ending the HIV epidemic and new HIV funding allocations. We'll discuss our Escalate project and what that specifically means for Indian country. And then at the end, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to hear your voice and um, how we can make Escalate work for Indian Country. Next slide. Um, so a disclaimer, this project is supported by the Health and Human Resources Services Administration, HRSA, um, of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS. Next slide. So, if you're familiar with NMAC, then you're familiar with our mission statement. NMAC leads with race to urgently fight for health equity um, and racial justice throughout the United States. So, what does this mean? And a great example of our mission statement in action is our Rise Proud project. So Rise Proud 2.0 is the continuation of a project, Rise Proud 1.0, that started in 2012. It looked at the mitigating factors that are causing black gay and bisexual men to have the highest number of new HIV um, acquisitions throughout the United States. And it developed a list of guidelines and recommendations for mitigating those risk factors. So we wanted to revise that original 
report. And the catalyst for us wanting to revise that report came in 2019 when the Trump administration released the Ending the HIV Epidemic, a plan for America. Um, so from there, we created a series of focus groups where we wanted to hear the community's input on what we needed to what needed to be included in the federal response in these local jurisdictional and in the epidemic plans. So we hosted a series of eight focus groups where we wanted to engage different populations that are the most likely to acquire HIV and those who are most likely, excuse me, the least likely to have um, positive health outcomes related to HIV. So as I said, we hosted this series of focus groups and our goal was to develop a list of recommendations that could be implemented in local jurisdictions ending the epidemic plans. And we wanted the recommendations to focus on improving HIV prevention, HIV care services, supportive services, and finally HIV related stigma. Next slide. So here are some of the findings that we found from our focus groups. These findings, this first set of findings focus specific on HIV prevention services. One takeaway that folks stated was that we really need to do a better job of engaging more elders throughout Indian country in the HIV prevention process. Elders hold the keys. They hold the stories, they hold the knowledge, they hold the respect. And oftentimes when we look at HIV prevention services, we see no mention or no inclusion of elders. But who do we know that educate the youth who are most likely to acquire HIV? It's the elders in our community. So what ways are we engaging those individuals? We also learn that location of services is a determining factor for an individual if they're going to receive prevention services. We heard some stories of folks traveling upwards to two, even to three hours just to get an HIV test. Um, we know that there has to be an integration of HIV education. Someone very specifically discussed the amount of shaming that elders felt around their sexual identity, around their sex, um, that led to a huge miseducation in HIV education. So how do we integrate HIV into education into prevention? Cultural humility was also a huge factor. Um, understanding that it is challenging for Native individuals to sometimes seek services from individuals who don't understand their culture or their way of life. That the quality of life of American Indian and Alaska Native communities was a huge determining factor. Many folks talked about not having access to sometimes electricity or running water. And it was very difficult to focus on HIV prevention, getting an HIV test, and sometimes your basic needs your basic needs aren't even able to be met. So what are we doing to support the quality of life for American Indian Alaska Natives um, throughout Indian country? And then lastly, HIV stigma is pervasive and it does impact a person's ability to receive prevention services. Um, do they receive prevention services from um, a place that's has been labeled as an HIV prevention location. Does that make it more difficult? Um, some people also talked about what type of messaging do people in the community receive if I as an individual go get screened for HIV? Does that mean that I'm sexually promiscuous? Does that necessarily mean that I am a member of the LGBTQ community? So when we think about stigma associated with sex, stigma associated with LGBTQ individuals, that overlaps with HIV stigma and prevents individuals from wanting to seek services as well. Next slide. So we also found that there were very specific findings related to stigma throughout Indian country. But a lot of our participants discussed the amount of sex shaming that goes on. The limitation that people feel being able to truly own and have autonomy over their sexual practices. And this sentiment was expressed more through the elder community. 
In the focus group, we also discuss low PrEP utilization throughout Indian country and how this relates to HIV-related stigma as well, or what we categorize as PrEP stigma. Once again, what does it say about me as an individual if I am receiving PrEP or if I'm pursuing PrEP? Once again, does it mean that I'm sexually promiscuous? Does it mean that I'm not using a condom? Does it mean that I'm having sex with multiple people? Is there anything wrong with that? But what type of image does that send and then what type of messaging comes out in the community around PrEP? And we also talked, heard some very specific examples around the importance of cultural competency or cultural humility, and very specifically how stigmatizing it can be to Native individuals when their medical practitioners do not understand traditional medicine and when they do not respect and value traditional medicine as well. So a culturally competent provider must understand that, yes, um, HIV care is important, but how can we blend traditional Additional medicine with that. And lastly, a lot of folks talked about disassociation from HIV care or from facilities that are considered labeled as HIV care facilities. Folks often talked about, and this is something that we did a series of eight focus groups focused on different populations, black, gay, and bisexual men, black, transgender women, black, cisgender women, Latinx communities, um, Indian countries, Spanish-speaking, English-speaking only, and something that was specifically unique to Indian country that we wanted to highlight was how does close family and relative relationships play a factor in HIV stigma? It really did. A lot of folks talk very specifically about a fear that they had of involuntary disclosure of their HIV status. So if I learn my HIV status and I want to go to a local clinic um, on the reservation, how is how am I going to interact with the nurse practitioner who might be a cousin? or who may be an aunt? And what's going to happen to my HIV status after I leave the clinic? Do I then have to worry about going back to the reservation, to my tribe, and learning that my HIV status has been shared? So we discuss a lot about how are we reinforcing HIPAA? How are we reinforcing confidentiality? Um, how are we making sure that people living with HIV, that their confidentiality is safe and that it is protected and that anytime they do disclose their HIV status, they do it voluntarily, not out of a fear that someone who is a relative or a close associate of mine works at a clinic and then goes on and shares my status. Um, next slide. Um, and one thing that came from our focus group was what can we do to end the HIV epidemic throughout Indian country? And these were some of the tailored messages that were discussed specifically. So we have to create a robust campaign that centers education, community awareness, and at the top, we must focus on stigma reduction. We also talked about technology um, and how important it is to have bandwidth and to have access to the internet. Um, we talked about ways to increase telehealth. We've seen specifically with COVID-19 an over 400% increase in the use of telehealth. That is not a reality for a lot of folks who are living in Indian country just because they don't have access to the internet. Um, we talked about a community responsive HIV care. Um, we also discussed intergenerational sexual health education. Um, we discussed how youth are a little more comfortable and open discussing their sexuality um, because we live in a different world where some of our elders or um, Folks who may be even over 40 don't feel as comfortable because they have been stigmatized so heavily so that they don't even feel comfortable talking about sex. So how do we create that intergenerational dialogue? How can we have someone like Bill, who is a person living with HIV, 
thriving with HIV, surviving with HIV for over 20 years, how can we have him share his experience, his knowledge, his expertise with young people, but then at the same time, how can we then invite young people into the equation and have them share their expertise and their knowledge and openness to talk about sex with someone like Bill? Um, and then we also, lastly, we discussed, and we all know, the paramount importance of data collection systems and how stigmatizing is it for um, Native individuals to be completely left out of data collection. Um, what does that say about value? What does that say about importance? And what does that say about inclusion? Um, Native individuals cannot just be lumped with other groups. And I, we all kind of assess that that is a problem that we do see you know so even when we discuss things like funding related to native communities if the data isn't there a lot of time the funding isn't there to support it but we know the need is there so what are we doing to make sure that we capture accurate data so that we can accurately tell the story of people in indian country um, related to hiv So I would say that the major, most important finding is that we really need to take tailored approaches to Indian country because the challenges are so different. Um, someone said that Indian country needs its own ending the HIV epidemic plan um, because the challenges are so unique that we must have a tailored approach to address these challenges. And today we're going to kind of hopefully be able to demonstrate how we are taking some of those lessons from the focus groups and applying them now to our work in Indian country. Because in MAC, we realize that we're not the experts at working with Indian country or Native Alaska, but what we would like to do is walk alongside um, organizations like the National Native HIV Network as a partner in doing this work. Um, so how does Escalate align um, with ending the HIV epidemic? So the federal guidelines from HHS um, say that we are going to end the HIV epidemic by 2030. And we all know by now that ending the HIV epidemic means that we're going to reduce new HIV acquisition by 90% by 2030. So from roughly 30,000 new acquisitions every year to 3,000. And we're going to do that by focusing on the 57 jurisdictions um, that account for over 50% of new HIV diagnosis throughout the United States. So an exciting, exciting announcement. Um, we recently learned that the Biden-Harris administration has proposed $660 million to HHS um, for ending the HIV epidemic. Um, and that is for the 2022 funding year. So we're really excited to see an increase in funding because it just means that we can do more great work, more specific work for specific communities that need the support the most. Um, so what does that increase look like? It looks like um, supporting the work that we're doing to reduce new HIV aggressively, um, while also making sure that we increase access to treatment, because we know that that is vitally important. We know that viral suppression works, but folks have to have access to treatment, and we have to make sure that we are able to sustainably engage them in treatment as well. Um, also, focus on expanding use of PrEP. I know Chris and other folks are working really hard to create specific messaging for Indian country and Native Alaska specifically around PrEP, and hopefully um, efforts like this can help support that work. And then lastly, making sure that we ensure equitable access to services and support um, resources for organizations like HRSA, CDC, IHS, and NIH. I think that might be a repeat slide, excuse me. 
Um, so next, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Chris Paisano, who is going to be able to talk more about how we are doing um, this work, um, specifically around Escalade. So as I said, last year in August, we held those focus groups. We held that focus group in Indian country. And when we had the opportunity to create and design a program that specifically focused on eliminating HIV-related stigma, what we wanted to do is we wanted to be sure that we had some focus and some intentional effort on ending HIV stigma in Indian country and Native Alaska. So Chris, I will allow you to take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. Yat eh. Um, my name is Chris Paisano. Gwadzi Halba, Christopher James Paisano, Yunishye, Kinsla Chitni Nishni, Tosoni Bashishi, Tachitni Dashi Che. Hat bono hatusha nali, and say hosoi dan, thou Oakland dan, nasha, a en mek banash nish. And my pronouns are he, him, do, and bi. So welcome everybody. So as Terrell has said, if you look at Escalate, it means ending stigma through collaboration and lifting all to empowerment. And in this, um, as Terrell had mentioned, that our previous director, Ace Robinson, has seen the need and therefore had made sure that he wrote a, um, that Indian country was included in Escalade, which is our program to go and to end stigma in all uh, communities. Next slide. Oh, again, next slide. <laughs> there we go. So as I said, what Escalade stands for is really to help us all to have zero HIV stigma throughout Indian country, throughout all of the populations in the United States. Next slide. And as Tuol has said, Escalate is funded by the HRSA, HRSA the Health Resource and Service Administration. And so to the 48 counties, within the US that uh, we, and they would like us to focus in, as well as the seven rural states that really have showing a lot of um, HIV new occurrences in the country. And so this is where we're gonna focus, but also to make understand that we are also focusing in Indian country outside of these areas. Next, next slide. Exactly. And so this is why it's very important, uh, especially with that listening um, session that we had and to make sure that Indian country in Native Alaska and to also our brothers and sisters in Native Hawaii, that um, we make sure that we are going to coordinate our efforts to really try to stop new HIV infections, but also to strengthen all of our community and community members that Escalate will do in uh, eliminating stigma within our communities. Next slide. And so these are our goals. So as Terrell had said, and even in, our, in the previous presenters, you know, stigma is a big thing. Um, we need to address stigma in our health care. However, whether that's clinics or in our hospitals, IHS hospital, dispel myth and misconceptions and disassociation from HIV clinics, support HIV disclosure so that you are in control, that people who are living with HIV are in control of their own destiny and not because of fear and not because of others' ignorance or lack of knowledge. And especially to address our internal stigma, which uh, stops so many people from getting the care that they need. Next slide. Wow, next slide. And so we're gonna do that through training. And how we're going to do that is that Escalate is actually um, of two tracks, individual training and for organizations. So all of these are meant to engage individuals like you and me, our community leaders, um, organizations, and it could be, um, of course, native organizations, um, AHS organizations, uh, any 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 type of organizations that are out there that are providing our services, making sure that they're culturally responsive, as Terrell had said, that they are community centered, 
and especially making sure that escalate helps the linkage to healthcare and treatment, which will create viral expression in new cases and reduce internalized stigma. Next slide. These are our goals. Next slide. There we go. So we just want to make sure that we are very clear. And as Terrell had said, NMAC is not here to take the lead in Indian country. We are not the experts in Indian country. You guys are the experts, even though I am from the Navajo Nation and the Pueblo of Laguna. But um, we are here to be partners. And so we really want to make sure that we understand that NMAC is first year that this Escalate is a pilot project and that it is there to include you know, your unique cultural perspectives. So as we go through this first year, we definitely are going to rely on the, not only the trainers, but also for the, those who are uh, taking and participating in the individual training, as well as the learning collaboratives and the technical assistance training that we will be having. So we will always be listening. And throughout this process, we really want to make sure that we hear your voices. Some things will work, some things will not. Um, I happen to, I saw a um, draft of the curriculum, very beautifully done. But we also know that no one training, no one curriculum is going to be able to uh, fit for all communities. So this is why in this first year, we're really going to rely upon your assistance to help us and to bring our cultural perspective. Because what works for Navajo that is very rural may not work for Tlicket. It may not work for the, uh, the Indian tribes in Oklahoma or in any other places across the US where our people are residing. And even in the urban areas, which has their own um, unique challenges. Because I grew up in Oakland, so I understand that as well. So I just want to make sure that NMAC considers year one as a pilot project there will be plenty of opportunities to hear your voice, to hear your recommendation, to make sure that uh, Escalate meets the needs of all of our peoples. Next slide. So with Escalate, when we know better, we live better. Next slide. So I would like us to imagine the world, if you want to close your eyes, that would be great. If you don't, that's fine. But where you can walk into any place in the U.S. and be welcome. You know, the one place that we should be welcome is, is to get our health care is a place free of stigma, a place where our well-being is the first concern for the providers, as Terrell had mentioned, but also for ourselves as patients. Sometimes if we don't feel that we are worthy enough to receive adequate care or first rate care, we won't receive that. So we can imagine that world. Escalate will help us get us there. In fact, all of us will help us get us there. Next slide. So what we always talk about stigma, but then you ask people, what is it? And how do we recognize it? Um, I looked over a couple of uh, dictionaries to find out what is stigma. And really it is the prejudice around the condition without knowledge. So for example, we all know about COVID. Here in the Navajo Nation, we really got beat up over COVID so much. And we lost a neighbor uh, up the street from me and other, uh, other relatives as well. But what happened, especially up north, there's a place called Cayenta that was a very hot spot for COVID. So what happened was people were saying, oh, where are you from? Where are you from on the Navajo Nation, we'd ask. And they'd say, oh, I'm from um, I'm Cayenta oh, you're from that place over there. You're, you're, you're where you brought that to us, our people. And that is stigma, okay? Fear based on the lack of knowledge. Now we know how to protect ourselves. We social distance, we wash our hands, we have face masks, we, we are we very respectful with each other. And one of the things I'm very proud here on the Navajo Nation is that the message went out is that we need to protect our elders, as Terrell has said, and, and our communities know, and so we stop socializing. We stop going from place to place and making sure that our elders and the young people are protected as well as ourselves. So as we know, stigma can lead to isolation as the film so beautifully said, self-hate, hatred from others, hatred for within our communities and even from some other social conditions. And it's all based on fear, a lack of knowledge and ignorance. 
So this is what we hope that Escalate will help address. And so that when we know better, we do better. Next slide. This I love. My coworker, Lauren Miller, came up with this. So sometimes when we talk about stigma or we're talking about trainings and these concepts, we, it's sort of hard to hear. We see the words, but we don't quite get a hand of it. But we all more or less know when hurricane season comes, we all turn onto the weather channel. We see Jim Cantori, he's standing there sideways holding his umbrella. So we all know the damage that uh, hurricanes can do. So if we see stigma as a hurricane, we know that a category one, which is still very strong, affects the individual. Category two then moves out to the family. We had heard where um, fear of disclosing your status, fear of being um, open with your sexual identity, you then can't tell your family. You do tell your family. And as one of the family members said in the film, people say, oh, don't go over there no more. Don't go hang out with that family. You know, they have HIV, they've got something. But Stan affects the community at large. And then we get to the place where it affects the country. So if you look at how hurricane and stigma, um, this example, you'll see that it's very real. It's very real for a person who's undergoing this. And so now that you know the damage that can occur when this happens, then you can really, I hope, have empathy for those who are going through this. So we thank Lauren Miller for bringing this up. Love this example. Next slide. And so one of the things, what is missing? So a couple of years ago when I was working at NAPSI, we were all about Debbie. They're like, you know Debbie, who's Debbie? You know that girl, Debbie? Well, Debbie stood for the diffusion of effective behavioral interventions, which actually focus on the self and how um, you reduce HIV through your own behaviors. So I love the sister intervention. It was for black women um, to help bring self-awareness and self-strength and it was beautiful, but all of these did not, they were, what they were missing was the stigma aspect of it and his cousin prejudice. So these uh, diffusion, uh, these Debbies, what happened was, okay, you focus on the self and you went out to community, but community is not acting right. They are still looking at you as um, broken, as the bringing of this disease to our community. So that is something which I am very happy that um, Escalate is going to come and help and address those. So it can, it is so prevalent as we know in our communities and everything can be done without knowledge. And if you look at back at the um, COVID example, great example. Next slide. So you, we talk about that, but what does it look like? So um, for example, if you went into your IHS facility now or into your local um, clinic and you go into the waiting room, how are the chairs arranged? Are all the HIV patients made to wait in one room, in another room? Are all the HIV uh, posters in one particular place? And even the client can perceive an uh, attitude from a receptionist if you walked in and you're transgender and they're trying to figure out in their mind, well, who are you? you know, and, and in their mind, they're like, well, are you a boy? Are you a girl? What are you? And you know, you can see how people react to you. Already, you're stigmatized. Or even, for example, if you had a, um, in your um, intake forms where you only have male or female check boxes instead of being gender inclusive, and then you're thinking, am I welcomed here? They're not even thinking about including me. So these, if, I wonder if these uh, uh, examples sound familiar into your cases or in your community. Next slide. So exactly, so who will this help? And it's meant to help everyone. Yes, we are focusing on Ryan White clinics and uh, those um, Ryan White clinics and organizations and those, and those people who are living with HIV. But also we wanna look at, especially to bringing it back to Indian country, individuals. It could be a grandparent, it could be a community leader, tribal council um, um, person, a person of in, who speaks and people listen to in the community our families, health providers, of course, organizations, and eventually our country 
so that we can create a welcoming in environment. Like I said, when we close the eyes and we want to imagine that place when we can walk in and we can get um, service without any type of shade, any type of attitude. But like I worked for, I used to work for William Sonoma. And I don't care who walked in. We welcomed you as a guest. That is how our health facility should be. You're a guest. What can we do to help you? Next slide. This will all, as Terrell has mentioned, continue care for people living with HIV. Adherence to HIV treatment, which is so important. We, have, we can test, we can find out if we're positive, but unless we are welcome to get those types of services, then it doesn't help anybody. Um, Escalate, we want to and will uh, make stronger community of inclusiveness, which makes for a healthy community. It will reduce HIV viral transmission. And this is really important. I really want us to make sure that the people who go through Escalate and outside, you know, have a voice of self, strong self-efficacy so that they can just hold people accountable and like, oh no, not today, don't come at me. I want to be strong. So this is what we're trying to do with Escalate. Next slide, please. So what Escalate is, um, it, there are two tracks, one for the individual training. As I said, we wanna build an army for community that is very aware of what um, stigma is and to hold people accountable. When you see it happen, you're like, oh, oh no, 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 we don't do that. But it's also for um, organizations. And there are two tracks of that. There's the technical assistance, when we hope that those who do take it will then graduate to what's called a learning collaborative for organizations. Next slide. And here's the other thing, Escalate is free. So in NMAC, when we have trainings, um, we treat you right, we do you right. So that as soon as you walk out that door, you need a, you need a ride to the taxi, we take care of that. We take, the, we take care of your, your transportation costs to the training site. We take care of your housing. We take care of all of your needs because we need you 100% present. So Escalate is free for those who want to take to get involved with it. Some resources you have on your side and responsibilities, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. And exactly, nothing's ever free, right? But we require, there are two requirements that we really need from you and from those who are going to take Escalate. And that's time commitment from participants and organizations. These trainings um, are very time intensive, but we've got great, excellent people who are going to help our participants and organizations work through all of this. And so we're gonna talk about the time requirements as well. And then also we're expecting you to participate within your community by doing a project. So you're gonna learn about Escalate. We're gonna teach you some best practices you're going to take these into your community and you're going to do a project because you're going to see what needs to be done. You're going to hear what needs to be done and then you're going to do what's going to be done. And you're going to like, I get it. So that this binder is not going to sit on your, it's not going to sit on your shelf. And it's not like, uh, I don't know how it is in other uh, tribal communities, but the Navajo Nation is famous on trainings, but nothing happens to them. Not here. You're, we're going to teach you. You're going to see, do, and make changes. Next slide. So as I said, uh, the individual training purpose is 40 hours. I have this written um, down here on what individual training is, but let me read this to you. So individual training needs are the needs of for um, people with eight living with HIV and for individual Ryan White care providers, clinician, clinicians, administrators, patients, navigators, as we said, um, tribal leaders as well who acknowledge the impact of HIV-related stigma on their client populations and communities. These communities are ready to create change, but may not, you may not have the organization capacity needed to create that change across their clinical settings and organizational families. So as you can see, it's, especially when we're talking about Indian country, it's, um, yes, we are focusing on Ryan White care providers, but we also want the people at the ground level the community leaders to undergo this training as well. Next slide. And so these are our goals. One of the things we want to do is if you are not living with HIV, you may be in one of these trainings where you will hear somebody 
who is HIV positive, and you are going to hear where their experiences with stigma. So we're going to create a very safe environment so that everybody can share, everybody can learn, so that with cultural humility, we will understand what people are going through, so that at the end of this training, we will, you will learn to identify stereotypes, you'll be able to see what the prejudice is, you'll be able to gauge in difficult dialogues to hear what people's experiences are. And then you'll understand what stigma is. It's not simply something that we talk about, it's something that is lived, that people do every day. Next slide. So this is where we're talking about the technical assistance. Actually, it's about, I believe, nine months or so, depending on your organization, of intense uh, technical assistance. It is tailored, so there's going to be um, uh, questions and answers that you're going to have to, your organization is going to have to go through so we can best figure out what is it that you need. So those interested in TA or in stigma reduction, uh, but do not have concrete steps to address stigma, and perhaps maybe one member hasn't or two members haven't had any stigma reduction um, training, they're the best candidates for TA. So this is a big wider scope for organizations to actually, they're, they're beginning the first steps. They, they're beginning the first steps of actually going through and learning how can we address stigma within our community, in our workplace, and what things do we have that we need to in play, in put in place um, for. And this is what technical assistance will do. So there is um, three to five hours work for each month for nine months that is expected. Um, but like I said, we'll be there along the way to make sure that whatever challenges you have, we can address those. Next slide. The learning collaborative. This is really interesting um, because it is a set way of learning uh, 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 across the board. This is really meant for the whole organization where you may have technical assistance for maybe your program. A learning collaborative really is meant for the whole. So you may have an HIV program, which would be great for to begin with technical assistance, but say like here, we have a big um, IHS facility a learning collaborative would require the um, dedication from the CEO all the way down to the person who is greeting the patients. So an, uh, learning collaboratives would, uh, will support organizations in addressing stigma and influence HIV stigma at the community, society, and structured levels. So you remember that hurricane model. This addresses that. This is what the learning collaborative is meant for. Organizations are at a stage where they are ready to develop and implement stigma reduction programs or have begun implementing such a program. Learning collaborative participation will assist those programs in reaching the next level of implementation and overcoming barriers to success, successful implement, implementation. So this is like a wider net, but also requires 18 months of really great training so that the end everybody there at the facility will understand um, how stigma affects patients and, and those who are coming to get um, services within you, within there. So there are action periods, as we say, followed by learning sessions, and all of these are meant to support as you grow each, each time that you go through it. And so we're there with you. We're there. We're going to be there with you. And so at the end, we're going to have very strong and healthy uh, organizations that will help um, and welcome everybody that comes in for treatment within uh, that organization. Next slide. Exactly. So then um, we're gonna support, supporting and empowering the implementation of the stigma reduction program at your organization to reduce this impact of stigma and your population within your, as I said, in your organization. But let me tell you a story. So what does this all mean? We're talking about individual training, learning collaboratives, and TA. You're like, what does that mean? Okay. So, for example, um, your clinic has a program of four individuals who do who does community outreach, condom distribution, rapid testing at community events, fairs, flea markets, cultural events, and gatherings. But you don't understand why your clinic's positive testing numbers do not correlate with treatment numbers. You've had three a positive rapid tests, and you referred them over to your clinic. You later find out that one never showed up. One made it to fill out paperwork, 
but left after the receptionist says, oh, the AIDS clinic is over there. And one did see a doctor, but the nurse saw his paperwork and handed him three condoms before seeing the doctor. The male nurse said, here, you should be using these. And so this patient never returns for treatment. So after you hear these experiences from the three, you have an idea of what stigma is, but you may not really understand what causes your low treatment numbers. You want to strengthen your programs, so you take the Escalate individual training. So you want a larger change, and you ask your executive director for Escalate training, and so you attend the individual one. Afterwards, you begin to recognize what stigma is in your clinics, and even in your outreach, you see how clinics, how clients are treated by staff, and in your surveys, uh, where clients will say that their treatment, they're treated by staff and made to feel separated by physical spaces, clinicians scold how they got HIV. You even see that these intake forms only have two choices for self-identification, male and female. So then you ask about sender, gender self-identification, and the answer you get is, well, we only had two genders here. So you, at this point, don't have any anti-stigma policies in place, but you're committed to implementing stigma reduction programs, and, but the clinicians and frontline staff don't even believe there's a problem. So at this point, you're not ready for the learning collaborative, the intense training for nine months, but you are ready for TA since you've taken the individual one. You see that there's more work to be done. And so the TA will help you draft um, anti-stigma reduction policies and other concrete steps. So TA will help your organization to begin implementing basic organizational change. Later, your CEO and executive director sees the great changes within your program and the increased access to care for those living with HIV. Your CAO asks the whole clinic, can they apply for training as part of the learning collaborative because she sees the great work and strides your program has made with individual and the TA. That is what Escalate is meant for. That's how we we're hoping to do. Yes. We have five minutes for this um, webinar, so we want to make sure that we do get to questions. So okay. if we wrap up fairly quickly, we appreciate that. Yeah, so thank you. So um, next slide. We'll hit this in five minutes. That's me in the 80s. I am a cheerleader. I am there to make sure that anybody who walks in, they want to, um, high quality um, uh, care and treatment. That's my job. That's why I was hired at NMAC. Next slide. So I'm also actually very happy at this moment to um, announce that we have a partnership with the National Native HIV Network. We're gonna rely on the network to help us bring Escalate to Indian country, Native Alaska and Native Hawaii for help adapt future trainings and the curriculum for everybody, as I had mentioned. We trust because um, you all have 50 years of combined, combined personal and professional experiences in the areas of HIV advocacy, frontline community outreach, leadership, and technical assistance to Indian country. And so because of all the participants here, we have a, you guys have a wide partnership across the country. Next slide. So again, with Escalate, when we know better, we live better. Next slide. And we'll do that together. Oh, you missed that. We're all going to do that together so we can get zero HIV stigma. Next slide. So I want to get in touch with this person. That's me, Chris Paisano. There's my information. Next slide. And so these are our great folks that we work with with HRSA. Give them a shout out for supporting us. Next slide. And of course, we have Paul Kawata. Charles Cesar, Terrell, my boss, that person there, Chris Paisano, but also to all the talented people that I work with at NMAC and the training center to have ending the epidemic. Uh, yeah, Aitze, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris, um, you know, for giving us that full explanation of the program. We appreciate it. And hopefully we'll get willing participants once it's been um, formalized for training. Um, so we really appreciate that presentation in the sense that, that there's a collaboration, um, you know, thank you for the background information on how that curriculum was developed um, for our community. So we're hoping that we can um, really take from some of the issues that were raised in our first presentation around the challenges to begin to educate our communities and our organizations to help to defeat stigma, right? So I think these two presentations were complementary in that regard. 
um, you know, hearing from the community voices, um, you know, and then seeing how we can formalize kind of that education uh, with the assistance of NMAC to be able to do that. So thank you. I also want to give a shout out to NMAC for hiring a native person uh, as staff that takes a lot of commitment um, from an agency, you know, to hear from the community and really take responsibility for it. So we want to thank the leadership of um, NMAC for um, incorporating that position and, and welcome Chris back into our circle um, as well. So thank you. Um, so just fairly quickly, I didn't see a lot of questions. Everybody was enjoying this presentation, so we thank you. Uh, there was one question regarding how our native communities are, um, are, are providing uh, testing as well as treatment services, particularly during the pandemic. Um, so that was a great question. I'm not sure if any of our panelists may want to ask that. I'm not sure if our panelists are also direct service providers, but at least from the network's perspective, we've had these conversations during our bi-monthly meetings about, you know, we have our regional membership um, participants kind of update us on what they have been doing. Um, and we've been doing through the network kind of initiative around self-testing. So a lot of agencies were um, encouraging individuals to take self-tests. Um, there is some capacity that still needs to be done for our communities to effectively do that. Um, but some of our agencies have been able to do that um, fairly successfully um, and also have been utilizing um, virtual platforms and encouraging uh, patients to continue to get their treatments. Um, there's a lot of work being done with our um, Indian Health Services partners in terms of providing ECHO services, um, who, who, which is a virtual platform where um, um, physicians and agency members can talk about a client, or I shouldn't say talk about a client, but discuss issues that may be affecting a client confidentially and provide um, resources with that. So we really want to be able to thank them for that as well. Uh, there is a message from our um, panelists in the chat or from one of our viewers in the chat from the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. Uh, they've developed a self-test program through the I Know Me site, and there's a website. So thank you for sharing that, Jessica. Um, interesting enough, we do have a, a webinar that is scheduled for May 20th um, with Dr. Rupa Patel, uh, who is in the Midwest, and she's gonna be talking about um, different options of PrEP, but also some, um, um, some discussion on self-testing um, and some protocols that may be utilized. So if you're interested in those subject matter um, um, as well, look for um, our registration and our announcements for our next webinar, which will be May 20th. Um, other than that, are there any questions for our panelists? Um, are there any final comments from our panelists? When we know better, we do better. Escalate. <laughs> <laughs> we want t-shirts that say that, Indian size too. So. Hey. <laughs> But we want to thank everyone, for um, all our presenters, for their presentations um, today around HIV stigma. We know it still exists. So these are tools and advice that we can take um, to work with our Native communities and for our non-Native relatives to reach out to our agencies who are doing this good work and utilize their voice and their work because they're the ones that know what is needed for our communities. Also, um, get in touch with our National Native HIV Network as well. Um, you can reach us at www.nnhn.org. We do have a monthly uh, newsletter as well if you want to sign up for that, so please do so. Um, other than that, I want to thank everyone for being a part of this webinar. Um, you know, continue to look out for some of our social media feeds um, as well as our webinar session. Again, thank you, Leah and Bill. Say hi to Abigail um, up in um, Seattle. They're doing such good work and, you know, Agencies like that really say a lot about the services that provide, you know, are being provided when it comes down from the leadership. So I really appreciate your advocacy, Bill, there in, in Seattle as well as the region. And our partners at NMAC, thank you for, um, you, you know, your continued collaborations and, you know, and, and listening to us. You know, it really takes a lot. So we want to thank you for that. Um, any last words, Savannah? Come in. I definitely want to thank all of our panelists and those people who were able to join us this afternoon for this wonderful presentation. Great, great. And then we have one final comment here uh, from Anissa. Um, they would like to be able to do a, a collaboration to do art 
um, in terms of HIV stigma. So there is contact there and we will take that down as well. So thank you everyone. We appreciate it. Uh, uh, enjoy the outdoors, get vaccinated. Hopefully we'll be all be able to be together soon as well, but continue to stay safe, wear your mask um, and hug each other with your arms like that. So thank you again. Uh, we shall see you soon. Take care.